Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight um, at IPCNY for our artist talk. Um, I'm Jen Bradovich. I'm IPCNY's Exhibition and Curatorial Manager. I'm here tonight for a conversation with Diana Beale, Ellen Lesperance, and Austin Nash. Um, these artists each have work currently on view at um, IPCNY's Summer 2021 New Prints Exhibition, which is called Lonely Hearts. These New Prints exhibitions are put together by um, folks out in the print field. They're juried from um, an open call that happens twice a year. And this year's um, summer show was juried by the artist Christian Baumgartner. Um, Lonely Hearts is on view now through September 18th. And we are open on Tuesdays through Saturdays, 11 to 6 p.m. And if you're not in town or you're busy and you're not gonna catch us before we close or you wanna just explore the show virtually, you can do that um, on our website. We have a 3D scan of the gallery there, um, which I'm showing you now. You can kind of walk through the space. You can walk up to the uh, works on view. You can click on those objects and learn more about them. And then you can also just explore the show um, through our website where you can see images, um, high res images of all the works. And you can also um, read statements about all the objects in the show. So this is a great way to see the show if you're just staying home or if you're not in New York. So about tonight's talk, um, just two notes about accessibility. Um, the event has live captioning in English. You can find those captions using the CC button at the bottom of your screen if you're on desktop or by going into the settings menu if you're on mobile. Um, second, we're gonna try to be verbally descriptive tonight about the works that we discuss on screen. It helps all of us who are experiencing art through our devices right now. So I will invite our artists to um, join me on screen. Welcome Diana, Ellen, and Austin to our program. Hello, hello. Um, please go ahead and uh, um, just unmute yourselves and say hi so we know your voices. Hi there. Hi, everyone. Hello. <laughs> hi. So we're happy to have all of you with us um, and talk about your work tonight. Um, for those of you at home, if you watched our previous uh, New Prince Artist Talks uh, the summer, you know that we've been trying out a new format. So these are more of um, a conversation. I'm gonna guide us through some questions and keep track of time, but artists do feel free to ask each other questions and respond to each other's work and ideas as we go throughout the program tonight. Um, for folks at home, please send your questions using the Q&A button. Um, I will take questions at the end or throughout the night, um, depending on how we're doing on time. The public chat will also be open, so feel free to contribute to the conversation there by sharing comments or by bringing up anything that's not a direct question. And then there's going to be a very quick survey at the end. Thank you for sharing your feedback. It helps us produce better programs. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, the theme for tonight's talk, uh, very broadly speaking, we're talking about um, process and we're talking about abstraction. So we're dealing with works tonight in various ways that think about um, something in their making behind what appears to be an, an abstract um, formal appearance, um, something in that image making that opens up additional lines of inquiry and exploration about how a work is made. And so we're going to talk about process, about intuition, uh, making and using archives, using constraints, chance, abstraction, all this stuff. Um, we have three very different artists tonight who are working with different approaches and ideas. And so this should be a really interesting uh, chat with a lot to unpack. Um, to get started, I'm just gonna show uh, a work by each of you that's in the show. And by way of introduction, um, you can just say hello and, and, and say hello to everybody and give a little welcome. And, um, I'd like to just hear some opening remarks from each of you thinking about the work that's in the show and generally speaking, how are you thinking about and engaging with these ideas of process and abstraction um, in your work? We'll start with Diana. Hi everyone, thank you for being here. I am based in Brookings, South Dakota, but tonight I'm zooming in from rural Wyoming. I'm at the U Cross Foundation. Um, and my work involves different media. I work with print media, 
I love Intaglio. I'm so happy to, to see um, my first printmaking teacher, Janet Falweg, in the audience. I work with drawing and um, really excited to share some of my ideas and processes with you and also learn from, from Austin and Ellen too. Thanks, Diana. Can you tell us um, just a little bit about this work? Sure. Um, this is the, the plate size is actually nine by 12 inches. It was made from three copper plates. Um, incorporates line etching and aquatin, spit bite. I actually started the plates in 2017. Um, I had encountered, I came across a box of drawings that I had made 10 years prior. So some of the line images are derived from these, you know, decade old drawings. And I had a hard time resolving this image. I would add information and, and then I would scrape it away. You can see some residue of some lines. Um, and so that it's something that I'm really interested in interested in with intaglio is the ability to add and erase, erase but the it's never really totally erased so that's something i like to take advantage of with the intaglio process awesome thanks diana mm -hmm. ellen hello <laughs> All right, so I'm Ellen Lesbrance, and this is um, a litho that I made um, with the Tamarin Institute last summer, um, master printer Valpari Remling. And um, it is actually the first set of lithos I've ever made. And um, I tried to, I guess, make some prints that corresponded to the work that I do at, in gouache. So I usually work in gouache on paper. And so this is um, this is a litho experiment really to see how the process would reorient my brain towards making an image. Thanks, Alan. And welcome, Austin. Yeah, hi there. Uh, I'm Austin Nash. I'm a printmaker based in Minneapolis. Um, and revisions is a animation uh, composed of 428 frames of screen prints. And so visually you can see it's three rectangles being marked by kind of a meandering white line, uh, along with this kind of static and ghostly uh, kind of accumulation of, of ink. So I like to think of it as someone constantly writing on a chalkboard over and over again, erasing and then reworking it again uh, and revising. Thank you. Um, there is, I feel, already a lot to unpack. We're going to get to all of that. Um, I'm going to loop back around and start with Diana, um, just to begin to open up this discussion of, um, of mark making and um, of abstract forms that we're kind of dealing with in general tonight. Diana, I want to ask you a little bit, like, how do you develop um, the visual language that you're working with? I know you um, have talked a little about these drawings that you that you have found and 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 began working with here. We're going to look at some other works a little bit later of yours that also deal with these drawings um, that you've made in the past. But how do you um, develop that language? It kind of seems to function across a lot of your work as almost a lexicon of of symbols that kind of gets employed and reemployed in various different ways. Sure. Um, well, a lot of the work and especially the etchings similar to the one that is in the exhibit and the one that's on the left of your screen, um, they come from drawing. So drawing is a really important part of my practice and my process and I love line. And um, for anyone in the audience who has engaged with intaglio printmaking, one of the most distinct and unique aspects of etching is the line quality. And so I, I like to think of these etchings as, I mean, they're, they're about etching. They come from a place of personal history and the drawings are often imaginative, they're automatic. Sometimes they're referencing things from my garden or my home or you know, observations. Um, 
And they're about layering. They're, you know, there's something very unique and beautiful about layering plates in etching. Um, it might be a little hard to see from a projected image, but there's this really beautiful, rich surface that happens when you layer plates and, um, you know, layering a spit bite from different plates. It sort of creates, for me, it, it reminds me of like a brush or, or a bruise. It sort of has this like similarity to our skin or, or um, our body and, so pieces like the right, it's it's actually, I think there's two plates. Um, I just had these plates that were unpolished and I printed them as a ground. They had scratches on them and I just, I love that surface. And then I developed um, drawing based off of that. So it was a response to the, the printed image. So they're really different ways of working, but it is about an accumulation and a response. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm hearing you talk a little bit about um, uh, that some of this is, uh, these drawings are uh, kind of like an automatic, like an automatic writing, some of these yeah. conversation and the layering that you're doing. I'm kind of curious if you can talk a little bit about like, what is the role of, um, like serendipity and chance here for you, just kind of an organic decision making as you're, you know, layering these drawings on top of each other, or even as you're completing one element of of the what was going to become this overall composition. Yeah. Well, I think the chance. I mean, it's it's like if you are a ceramicist and you're putting this thing into a kiln, you know, after a while you sort of know what's going to happen. You sort of know what the outcome is going to be, but it's always a surprise, right? Um, and part of the reason that the prints like the one on the left take me so long is that that decision-making process is really slow, but it also involves a lot of proofing. So I have a plan. I develop the images on tracing paper, um, but I just, I embrace accidents or fall biting. Um, so you never really know, you never really know what it's going to look like. You know, you just respond to what is happening. And if you don't like it, then you can sand or scrape away. Yeah. Um, whereas, and when A is B, because I'm just starting with this printed plate, it, there isn't a lot of chance. There's a lot of calculation. There's a lot of slow drawing and slow thinking and then working and you know they're similar in a way that you're working slowly and putting something away and revisiting um but chance definitely you never can really know what's going to happen yeah so you embrace it or you just cut it up or you put it away or scrape or sand yeah yeah and just kind of um make that element of reworking the image part of the way the image like lives and uh, you know participates as a, almost like a collaborator in the right mm -hmm. um i'm glad you mentioned um uh sorry you mentioned not you didn't say the word constraint which is the, the word that i am always thinking of when i was thinking of this talk but you mentioned something else maybe like a structure or similar I want to go to the next slide because I want to hear a little bit about a way that um, uh, setting up uh, this idea of responses and the way that you maybe work with um, respond responding to specific constraints or specific practices, specific um, maybe assignments, um, and the role of that in your piece. So I'm showing you here um, this um, this image in Fig E, which uh, at first glance, we may not have any idea what this means. Um, this may be a little hard for us to unpack visually. And so I wonder if you can first just tell us a little about what's happening in the piece, you know, visually, mm -hmm. and then we're going to go to the next slide, and I want you to tell me a little bit about how it was made. Sure. Um, so this is an important slide, um, to sort of the, the one with the, the text, um, I'll get into that in a moment. So I got so burned out on etching. I decided to shift gears and start working with 
relief printmaking, and these are really about chance. There, I, you know, I just, I have this inventory of blocks. Um, some of these images are, you know, they're, they're like automatic drawings, um, that peach strawberry broccoli thing, I, you know, it's, I love to garden. And so those kind of shapes and colors and, you know, they make their way into my work. And then um, I have laser engraved blocks from drawings that I cut apart. So then, you know, they really don't, they're, they're quite abstract. And I just layer and layer and layer until it has this certain sense of visual harmony, but also this sense of visual dissonance that makes sense to me. So these are, these are easy to print for me in com com compared to etching, but they're also difficult because they're hard to resolve. Um, and then Emma, if you wanna move to the next slide. So a few years ago, I was having a conversation with a, artist friend of mine who some of you may know, Lydia Deemer. She's a phenomenal artist based in Iowa City. And she told me about a poet named Bernadette Mayer. And she introduced me to Mayer's writing prompts. And you can, anyone that's interested, you could just um, search Bernadette Mayer writing prompts and you'll be able to find them. And I just, I, I immediately, was really taken by her work and by these writing prompts. And so I decided, okay, I'm gonna try following this one, a, sh a shocking experiment. And um, I don't have any high school or college notebooks. I mean, it was that wasn't a, a thing that interested me, but I did have a scrap of, scrap of paper that was taped to my studio wall. And the scrap of paper, you see the um, text at the top and branching pipes that's from a transistor radio manual so it's like this nonsense and what I have been doing is I've been extracting and collaging titles from the scrap of paper so one of the first titles that I extracted from this body of work was and when a is b and how I interpreted that is things are not always as they seem you think something's one way, but it's really another way. And so I use this sort of chance collaged experiment to help me find parallels with things that I'm thinking about, but also to guide and drive the sort of the conceptual structure of this body of work. And so in figure E, it's, it also comes from this scrap of paper and it sort of reads to me as a diagram. And I, and I get that description from, from that image as well, in some ways. In some ways, but not others. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know anything about transistor radio. I don't know why. I must have been collaging with a transistor radio manual. And I don't remember how it ended up on my studio wall. Well, I love... Um your thinking about this reading as a the the finished work reading as a diagram partly but uh but it's so opaque um for the you know it's not a diagram that any of us could follow to do anything with right like it isn't diagram diagrammatic that way so right. I want to want to put a pin in that thought and we'll come back to it later okay. um, but in the meantime I want to skip ahead um, to the next, and I'm going to show a couple of images here from your project 26 Maps, um, an alphabet, which is a portfolio of 26 etchings, all about um, 10, uh, sorry, 12 by 10 inches. Um, can you tell me just a little about this project, how it came about, and how you're thinking about maps and alphabets here? Yeah. Um, you know, I think I started making some tiny etchings. And I was curating them and signing them. In the first two, I titled Map A and Map B. And then eventually I thought, you know what? I should make an entire alphabet of these. And the project took me about six years. I work on a lot of different bodies of work at a time. And I would, you know, I would work on them mainly in the summer. And 
as I mentioned before, I love line, I love line etching, and I love how, I love the simplicity of the way that a line etching looks on a piece of paper with the embossment and the plate tone. Um, and so I'm not thinking about maps as, I'm not, I'm not thinking about place necessarily. Map to me is a verb. It's like mapping a decision that's made at this time. And if you look at them all together, it, it's you know a comp compilation or a constellation of my thought process over time. And the alphabet is really just a way to index or organize. And to create, um, uh, right, to organize like a viewing experience, right? Like if you, yeah. if these are um, thought um, sequentially and have a sort of pacing to them. Yes. Uh, one after the next, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, you can take a look at the entire project on my website and, you know, there the placement of the plate is in different, you know, the placement sort of undulates. And so it emphasizes this sense of pace and sense of time and just, you know, they, I intend for this project to be hung in a line so that the viewer can very clearly see that and sort of follow along. Yeah. With that in mind, I wanna show um, an image of Austin's work um, that also, oh, you know what? I forgot that was there. Uh, let's go to Austin's work. And we'll come back to this if we have time. Um, uh, I want to show this image of Austin's work, um, which is some work from 2019 graduation. Um, these are, well, Austin, I'll let you explain. Tell us what these are. Oh, yeah. So it's a series of uh, three split fountains or gradient prints that I created and were displayed at High Point. But as Diana was talking, I was like, that is exactly, it was the same. Um, I guess interest, uh, the installation at High Point is 12, uh, and it's a similar way that you're moving through these tones of color, uh, almost like you're moving through a poem. And so for me, it, it wasn't about the stencil shaping that space, it was more how I was moving color through that space. And so some of the gradients are extremely smooth, um, while others are almost uh, more uh, percussive or there's kind of a beat to them or having even a vibration between the colors. Um, and so I was interested in that kind of experience of a space by walking through it in, in, a, in a line. Well, and I think um, this is a great example. And Diana, your previous work, and the reason I put the, or I tried to put these uh, juxtaposed, um, but I forgot about that middle slide. Um, it really underscores, right, this seriality that we often talk about with print, or this way of structuring a, a looking experience that has to do with moving a, a viewer through time um, over the course of like a portfolio or a project. And so um, Austin, I one thing that becomes so evident, this happens in your alphabet as well, Diana, <clears throat> is the way that um, the differences in those subtle gradations seem so apparent next, once they're in contrast with each other, but not so much, you know, one work at a time or even two works at a time. It really reveals itself over the course of the series. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, they're, they're meant to be almost treated as, as triptychs or, or much larger. So there's this kind of, I think accumulation would be a nice word to the meaning and, and to the, the flow of the work. Yeah, for sure. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about um, the titles. So this on the far left where we have the yellow moving through a green, moving kind of quickly through a green and then going to blue. This is June 11th, 8.59 PM. And then the middle piece is June 20th, 6 AM, which is like a sky blue that fades into kind of like an off white or cream color. And then the final piece goes from orange very subtly down to yellow, July 26, 8.01 PM. Now I had asked you a question in an email, which was, I read these. Um, I have a little bit of a conceptualism background. And so I had really read these as like timestamps of when these prints were pulled. Mm -hmm. You had corrected me. Tell me instead what these title, the work that these titles are performing here. Well, I mean, they, they are meant kind of in that. I, I'm hoping that people can take them in a few different directions. So when they were pulled, I think is really beautiful. Or even the idea that there might be a particular moment in a time of day where you're getting this feeling. Uh, in truth, <laughs> these are actually based on kind of, I guess, important moments or days to me. So uh, I won't say the specific like date and relation, but one is my birthday. One is my partner's birthday. And then one of them is like the date of our first date. Like the anniversary of that. So 
Um, and it was true for all 12 of them. They all kind of relate to uh, family dates and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think um, you explained to me that you were, the way you described it in your email was um, really trying to evoke an emotional content of a moment. But of course, um, when we're dealing with abstract works like this, right, that the specificity of that moment and the emotional content of that moment is known to you, but not to us, right? Um, and so I wonder if you think, can, can tell me a little how you think of, um, you know, what the, and maybe you already alluded to it a little bit, but like what the role of the viewer is here um, in coming to these works. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, just as much as the screen being a collaborator and someone who's completing the piece uh, and bringing a completely new perspective into it. I, I think, yeah, for me personally, I don't necessarily want to push them in any one specific direction uh, and leaving it kind of open to that, uh, I don't know, sensation that you can get. Um, especially in, in the sense that we all have our own kind of unique meanings of what a color, like that yellow and that green might mean something very unique to one person. And it's even just that sense that color is very relative and that the meaning or the, the feeling of it can change as it sits next to a, any set of different colors. For sure. I wanna ask you too, like how, um, I'm not a printmaker. Tell me, how do you, um, tell me how you, is this like a total trial and error process that you figure out what these gradations are gonna be? How do you work through these color pairings together? How do you, how do you figure out that color? How oh yeah, yeah, well, that's kind of the beautiful thing about a, a split fountain. So a split fountain is taking, uh, it's kind of, it's similar to a rainbow roll in that you're taking multiple inks and blending them together on the squeegee. And in a way that it's kind of a living thing that you're shaping and that you can constantly adjust. So there's usually a series of pulls that I'll do where I'm editing the color a little bit and changing it and seeing how the blend is happening. Uh, and then I, you know, once I'm confident with it, uh, I'll print a few. But as you're pulling with every pull, um, the ink is continually kind of moving around and blending further and further. Um, so it makes for a kind of a uh, collaborative effort with doing the squeegee too, which is cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, another thing you mentioned in our in our chat before this was um, that when you were making this pull series, you were thinking about the screen as having a memory and the way that that can enter into a collaborative space um, with the artist. Can you talk a little more about that and about the series? Oh yeah, so this is uh, the pull series. So it's four rectangles of yellow and pink with a dark blue line um, kind of cutting through them in different directions and kind of I guess, yeah, just curving in different directions. Um, and you'll see the actual residue of the past pull. So it's four sequential pulls that are, that are going on. Um, and so basically in realizing and doing the kind of different pulls, I realized that some of the pigment was held in the actual screen itself in the mesh. Um, and so I was actually able to pull that into the next pull and be able to build up these kind of abstract narratives with it. Yeah, I think these are really beautiful and they and they really um, I was struck when I saw your your image selection of the way that they really clearly I thought pointed toward where you were moving with revision with the work in the show. Um, uh, and so I think maybe let's loop back to that. I think it's our next slide. Um, this is some of the work in progress. So take us inside the making of this. I know we have 428 um, days. <laughs> of pulling here, tell me more. Yeah, so you can see kind of on the right uh, image of the screen with me pulling the ink through and you can kind of see how it actually juds over, kind of curves over as I move the, the squeegee. And then on the other side, it's just a series of more black and white prints. And so the, for 428 days, I, I woke up, poured ink onto a screen and pulled a print. Um, and so it was a daily practice of this printmaking and doing these kind of different uh, experiments almost like I was putting different inputs into the screen and then collaborating it to see uh, what I could actually make with that and kind of output. And so you can see, especially to the right, I love how sculptural it can get, especially when the blend is really smooth. It's just the effects and kind of the curves and the, the lighting is really beautiful. 
Yeah, I I was really surprised and glad glad you sent these because I was really surprised to see just how subtle that could be too. Like it's the one in the the sort of bottom corner there, you can kind of barely see that ink, that white on there, right? It's like very um, ghost like. They they have a real eeriness to them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, and even at that point, it's not necessarily just the, the memory of the screen, but more just the way that the colors are blending into each other yeah. and creating that effect. And so um, what compelled you to uh, start this daily project? What, when did you wake, wake up on day one and then wake up on day two and say, okay, we're going to do it again and we're going to do it again and again and again times 428? Oh, yeah. I mean, there was this tiny thing called COVID-19. Um, <laughs> Tell us more, yeah. Yeah, so I think it started uh, March 13th was the first time I was like, okay, this is gonna be a daily thing. And for me, it was just something that I could kind of, uh, a practice I could return to every day and kind of have it have some sort of stability with it. So no matter what was going on outside, there was this time I had to myself where it was just me, uh, the squeegee and the screen and pulling these prints and trying to make sense of things, but not necessarily um, feeling forced to. It was just a way for me to work through without uh, without reaching anything specific. Yeah, I, um, you know, I'm struck by, uh, you know, we just were talking about accumulation um, in the context of your um, graduation piece and in the context of Diana's um, uh, alphabet portfolio. And here we have this accumulation like taken to almost an extreme, right? We have like, yeah many 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 of these and so um i think what's so interesting about a process like this um is that it really becomes not just an archive of you know the different possibilities of what can happen what interaction can happen between you and the matrix and the you know the the surface you're printing on but also in the context of doing this as a daily exercise um, and daily action really becomes an archive of time um, and of a period of time. And I wonder, is this like an ongoing, uh, does this continue to expand? Is this, it, does this have an end in sight? Like, where are you now with this project? Oh, absolutely. You know, so it's definitely ongoing. There's a reason for, you know, being titled revision. It's something that I feel like I can always return to. I, I feel like I've built up a library of prints and I'll continue to add to that. And then I can always go back to that and edit it in different ways and then present it uh, kind of anew. I saw, I saw Diana nod a little bit there. I think she related to that. Yeah. Yeah, Austin, I have a question. So 428, yeah. how did you arrive at 428? Did you, oh, did you just stop one day or what, did you set out to make that number? No, okay, so yeah, I didn't set out to make that number. I almost, I, I stopped in the sense that they said, okay, I think we're returning back to normal. And I was like, okay, I think I can kind of stop this. Uh, but I, that's not even necessarily uh, the case. And then the animation that was shown, did mm -hmm. it come from these? It did, yeah. Got it. Yeah, and I should point out, so it's 428 days, but each of those days I was pulling multiple prints and doing a ton of different experiments between using single lines to multiple lines, vertical pulls, all sorts, you know, you saw the more kind of sculptural ones that you don't see here. And of those, I just pulled 428 kind of to represent that time uh, in between. Um, I wanna ask a, a question here that comes from the audience and others at home, please do send questions. I have this question um, for Austin as well. The question is, how did the decision to create an animation come about? Did you know you would continue adding to it daily when you first started? I mean, we talked a little about that. Or did it start off with a single standalone work? So how did you, um, how did you make this leap to um, video? Because we end up with something quite different than you know, just a um, kind of a series of, of prints when we move in into this like temporal looping, um, very, very, um, rhythmic and time-based, or we could say print is time-based, but when we move it into video, it becomes very explicitly time-based, right? Um, how did you make that make that transition? Had you worked with video before? What compelled you? Oh, yeah, well, let's see. So it, it was completely organic in some ways, but in other ways, 
I was always kind of, I don't know, uh, maybe primed to be able to jump to video. Um, so it started with the pull series and doing it in colors. And I did a whole kind of range of different colors and of those black and white was one of them. And so I started scanning them in just to organize what I had done. And in flipping through the black and white, I just noticed there was a certain kind of movement happening. Um, and that also the contrast of the colors and the ghostly effect um, was really beautiful to animate. And so that's why I chose this black and white um, and to continue to do that uh, as an animation. Yeah, it really looks like film. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It really has a quality of, of um, like, a, like just that I'm looking at film or that I'm looking at light. Like it, it just evokes a lot of like cinematic, um, like feeling to it. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. And then in some cases, I mean, uh, in the show it's on a screen, but there are other times when it's projected and there's kind of a, an additional glow that gets added to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's super beautiful. Um, okay, I want to just take a take a detour and talk to Ellen for a bit. Um, so in our next slide, we have a big, a big, um, a big set of things here that I hope we can use to tackle a couple of, of things at once, Ellen. And so I want to ask you, first of all, Take us a little bit inside what's happening behind this image, and then how do we get um, how do we get to the finished products that your work take? And this this can take many forms. This can take um, often the gouache paintings, which you've mentioned, can also take these um, knitted garments. And so, just how do we? What are the inputs? If we're thinking about inputs and outputs, which I think was a really useful um, term from Austin. What are our inputs here and what are our outputs? Uh, let's see. I, I guess if we're going to be using that vocabulary, the input would be the middle image. So for the last, I don't know, decade, I've been trying to archive all of the jumpers or sweaters that were knit to be worn as protest um, garments by a group of women in England in the 80s and 90s called the Green and Common Women's Peace Camp campers. There were people that lived at a site where there were 96 nuclear cruise missiles and tried to get them um, to leave. So throughout the era of the peace camp, it was 81 to 2000, there was a lot of knitting. And so I've been traveling to the UK and trying to look through archives to find examples of this knitwear. And so the paintings and now the prints that I make look really um, they look like they're abstractions. You know, we we're talking about organizing the three of us under this rubric of abstraction, but they're really not abstraction at all. They're just in a language that a lot of people don't have access to, which is symbol craft. Um, so if you look at the image on the left, it is the pattern for that garment. You can just see part of her garment in this still in the middle, but I tracked her through this um, nonviolence in action film. So I have an image of the front of it. I have an image of the sleeves. I have an image of a partial image of the back. Um, so trying to kind of recreate these garments in the present or in a future world, it means to repattern them. So the maybe if you switch to the next image really quickly, it's, it'll be easier to talk about. So the front of the sweater is superimposed over the back of the sweater. The front of the sweater is that landscape of the tree. The back of the sweater is this lunar moon. There's the rainbow sleeve that you saw in the still on the left. There's another kind of fair isle sleeve on the right. And then there's also a pattern for pants that also gets all fit in on a singular piece of paper. And so, um, yeah, I mean, these are gouache paintings. So each square is its own admixture, which is why I was really excited to try to figure out a way to make a lithograph because I imagine that it would be a lot simpler to just have a, you know, like have a, a larger shape and then have that larger shape, uh, you know, superimposed on another larger shape to get at this transparency that I usually do just, you know, like brushstroke at a time. But if you want to go back to the last one, then these are actual um, 
serviceable patterns for people that know how to knit. So you can follow the lines and the stitches and then you, and then I recreated the sweater. So this, um, the two are, are often shown together in my work. You've got the pattern and then you've, or the gouache painting and then you have the sweater. And so you see the front of it on the right and the back of it on the, um, on the plinth. I think these are absolutely mind blowing. Um, I will just say, I in putting this together and looking at these, I have spent so much time zooming in and just trying to like comprehend, you know, and in watching a couple of your other talks and and hearing you talk now about, you know, here's where you can see a sleeve and then there's this sleeve. I feel like I can almost see <laughs> what's happening here, but. But you're, you're absolutely right when you say, you know, we're thinking about kind of broadly, we're thinking about abstraction or, or process tonight, but, but these are not quite abstractions, right? These are manuals for someone um, who can speak the language of, uh, that you're working in. Um, what did you, um, what made you turn to symbol craft? Uh, I mean, I've been a knitter since I was a child. My grandmother taught me how to knit as a child. Um, and I did a lot of knitting in, you know, like my youth and then ended up applying to grad school with a whole portfolio of knitwear for a visual arts degree at Rutgers. I mean, I just like, and then I ended up working at Vogue Knitting in New York City. I just know knitting. It's like my brain is a knitting person's brain. So, I mean, that has a lot to do with why when I started researching Greenham Common, I mean, there's so many things to look at from that, um, that, that historic site. I mean, there's so many things to learn about second wave feminism, about the anti-nuke movement, and just like about all sorts of things. But my, my brain was just like, you know, like cued into the knitwear. So yeah, so this is an image of the piece in the show next to its source image. And yeah. it's, it's the woman on the left, correct? Who's correct. Okay. Yeah. So when I <laughs> correct trying to figure out how it could possibly be the sweater on the right. Um, <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, if, if I could talk you through it, maybe a little easier. Well, one thing to think about is that I mean, the the first thing that pops out at me about the garment on the left is that it's knit with variegated yarn which is a yarn that as you knit it, it kind of turns from one color to the next to the next, and then that repeats. And so in my gouache paintings, I make like this mathematical system for myself to go through different colors. So it's like, you know, 97 green and then 98 like plus what, like green white and then like three pinks or whatever it is. And then I repeat that. But when I was at Tamarin, we had this opportunity to look at, um, you know, like samples that I brought of variegated knitting and to try just like creating rainbow rolls with them. Um, I think we had one that was a 10 color rainbow roll. Um, and then like, if you, if you ink plates and lay them down in different ways, they superimpose each other. Um, or like, I think one time we did all nine colors on one roll and then another time we like spread it out. So there was just a few of those colors and they ran the opposite direction. So it's just like a different way to play with that. But so variegated yarn, there's also like this motif of a Greek key that runs through that sweater. So you can see that. Um, you can't really see her sleeve very closely unless you zoom in, but there is a labyrinth on it. Um, yeah, so it's all there. And then also like the shape for cowl neck or not cowl neck, um, shawl neck is this really specific uh, kind of V shape that overlaps, which you can see um, there's a triangle created from the way that that overlaps. So it's, I mean, that's, that's what's happening with why the shapes look the way that they look. It's based on the pattern. Absolutely mind blowing. I think they're so beautiful. Um, Tell me a little bit more about um, the symbol that I didn't catch the name of. Um, Labyrinth? That I, yeah, that's the, this, this sort of um, like a, um, like, it's kind of like a hammer kind of. It's a double-sided axe. An axe, there you go. Yeah. Um, for folks oh, at home running yeah. inside there. Yeah, it's the, it's on the sleeve. Um, 
I mean, I think this this garment is really fascinating because it has two symbols that are quite ancient. The Greek key is this um, one of the oldest uh, symbols that we find in pottery in um, ancient Greek and Roman uh, mosaics. I mean, it's everywhere. It's this meander. So to utilize the meander as a symbol is to talk about, you know, like the way that life kind of is unknowable, it folds upon itself and it's just like a traveling, I mean, it's just like this giant metaphor for life. But the Greek key, I'm sorry, the labyrinth is a double-sided ax that was, I guess it's associated with a Minoan culture, which was a matriarchal culture. So it was claimed in the late seventies. Um, it was on the cover of a Mary Daly book called gynecology, but it was claimed by second generation feminists and lesbians as a power symbol. So you, it's, um, it was all over Greenham Common. That's what that is. It's so interesting to hear that sort of unlocks, um, you know, I'm just thinking about what it is to not know a language and be encountering this and trying to decode, you know, what I, what I see. Um, and I, you know, I'm glad you mentioned the experimentation at Tamarind because I wanted to ask you a couple questions about that. Um, and, and it's also wanted to ask like, what happens with when you have these source images that are um, black and white um, and you maybe have limited information about a, a particular garment, how are you making decisions about the color ways that you're using and, and how you're, maybe a similar question I was asking Austin, like how do you make those choices about color? Yeah, I think if you, can you go to the next image? Cause I think it's another translation of the same sweater. No, the next one, maybe one more down. One more down. Oh, that one. So that is the, that is a translation of the same sweater. Better. So you can see that that's in gouache. So I translated that black and white variegated yarn in a totally different color way. Um, and then I had um, another opportunity to take a trip to an archive that I hadn't visited. And so I actually ended up seeing the backside of that image or of that jumper. And so I, it, it gave me more information. There's now the snake that ends um, a in the middle at the top of that thing that looks like an arrow there's a snake head at the top of uh one of the greek keys there's also this unidentifiable symbol on the pocket that is maybe a rainbow so it's i mean it's like extrapolation the more i get to know about those jumpers the easier it is for me to extrapolate um but it's also invention yeah right so because you're not ending up i mean to what degree are you ending up with something exacting? Not quite, right? You do have to do a little guesswork. Yeah, I mean, I get really excited. There was another piece in the show that you had that first image from where I got really excited because I did find so much information about that initial garment. Like I knew everything about it and down to like a, a badge that was on it. But that's really rare. Like I'll put a pin in a garment, you know, and say like, okay, let's wait to see if I find out more about this, if it's really, really partial um, or not, or sometimes it's just fun to, to try to invent, you know, based on what I see. Based on what you, yeah. And what you maybe have gleaned from, from the research at large, right? Like your whole kind of knowledge base. You said 10 years you've been, you've been working on it. I've been doing it since 2000, it's more now, I guess. I've been doing it since 2008. I mean, there's other protest histories that I research and I find garments to um, recreate. I mean, I think of the paintings very much as portraits. They're just like not about likeness. They're about what people are um, deciding to um, wear. So yeah, it's not just Greenham Common that I've been looking at, but specifically Greenham Common since 2008. Right, right. They're so beautiful and fascinating. Um, I And Diana, this is why I kind of like set aside for a second your, your comment about, um, I think you called them, what did you say? I said, I wanted to remember that. Um, you said you were thinking about uh, those works as a diagram. Um, 
And so this is why I kind of to kind of wanted to put a pin in this because if we think about the works that Ellen's making as being diagrammatic in the sense that they really can, you know, like lead to the creation of a of a thing, to the recreation of these garments. Um, I it just like it makes me think about what that function of a diagram is, what the function of um, you know, like again, I guess I'm thinking of Austin's inputs and outputs. Like if if someone's looking at your work, Diana, like what might the diagram be for? And well, this broad. I just <laughs> it's not even a great question. I'm just like trying to puzzle through this a little bit because I think you know you there's something interesting about you know having started with a transistor radio manual that is diagrammatic right it, it is there to orient you to a thing and and um, explain a thing for a usability um and so I wonder I don't know if there's a question in there <laughs> I think so I have a response um so first of all, I guess I think of the work as a document, as a document of time, as a document of a decision or a series of decisions made at that time. And so it's a record and that changes over time. Um, for instance, just you know, encountering this box of drawings that were made over a decade ago and trying to remember where I was at that time and what I was thinking about, but also how your drawing changes over time. Um, so I think of it as a document, but also just, you know, starting from one of Mayer's prompts, it helps you arrive somewhere you could never expect. It helps you pair things or find parallels that you couldn't otherwise. So I'm really interested in that, in, in how, you know, I'm here at UCross and I'm meeting writers and they too talk about how they use constraints, maybe for instance, in how they teach writing. And one writer was talking about how they assign flash fiction assignments to their classes, you know, and, that assignment takes you somewhere different. It, 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 it forces you to think in a way that you normally wouldn't. And so the work arrives somewhere new. Expected. Yeah. Ellen, I'm showing here um, another image of one of the lithographs that you did with um, Tamarind. Um, and so this is one um, that has this kind of um, collaged element um, happening in addition to um, just the print. And so what's happening here on this sheet? Yeah, I mean, the other two, I did I did three editions with them. And the other, the, the one that's not, the other two that are not in the show are both really not flat at all. They have added elements. Um, this one has the garment that you see the woman holding the who killed Karen Silkwood sign wearing, which is, you know, black pants, black sweater, but then also black shawl. So you can see that there's a piece of paper that's fold that's that's printed, um, not opaque, and then it's folded, and then it's, then the print is lays on top of that, and then playing with the thought that that woolen shawl is probably wool. So there's a wool tag that's created for that. And then also you see that she has this incredible nipple um, kind of pin or emblem on the bottom of the sweater. And so there's a pin that's printed or cut from silver foil. And then there's also a knit nipple um, in silk. So yeah, they're all they're all in the print together. And I wonder if um, you know the. I wonder if um, like you talked a little bit about some of the ways that um, collaborating with Tamarind sort of reoriented re oriented your thinking process a little and how you approached this. Were there other ways that that first time printmaking experience like changed your approach to these works, or things ended up, you know, in kind of a different way than you anticipated them going? I mean, there was just, there was, I mean, it was really, really 
fruitful. And I think because I was totally new to it, I didn't have any sense of like maybe constraints that people that are in a process over a long period of time get, um, you know, like overwhelmed by or hung up on. I just like didn't know something was or wasn't possible. So we just played. I I wanted there to be a dimensionality to the prints. So that means that we added badges. Valpori Remling can literally make absolutely anything that you want um, out, come to life in a matter of, you know, like an hour. So you can just be like, yeah, that looks awesome. I mean, it's, it was crazy. Um, but I mean, for me, not having to do that work of one stitch being one brush mark um, for every single print, you know, like I still did the black marks for days and days and days and days on mylar but then it was a shape that could get printed you know however many times and however many colors you know with rainbow rolls or not or the stone could be used this way or that way i mean that was really refreshing to me it made it open things wide up for yeah. sure yeah absolutely it's always exciting to see um you know someone have that that experience where uh they are encountering encountering print kind of for the first time and and it kind of uh, you know unlocks like these different ways of working and and thinking about you know how you make this the works are so layered you know as paintings and then that's so much a part of the print the way of, of thinking print that it it really feels like a natural um a fit for for works like these yeah totally um, I have a question from the audience. Oh, um, I have a question from the audience that Ellen says, did I answer this? <laughs> um, I don't know if you answered this. What role does craft play? I think you kind of did um, answer this. And I, I think we might get to, a, a, to a, a, another way of answering this with some of our other questions here tonight. Um, if you have questions at home, please feel free to send them in. We've got about 15 minutes left here and I'm gonna ask some more questions of my own, but feel free to send any that you have. Um, I think, uh, Ellen, for, uh, you know, I think I alluded to this before, but what's so fascinating to me about these is how, for me, I, I can't understand these, but for someone who can read symbol craft, um, you know, they are, com they are completely different viewing experience. And so they feel abstract or they can feel like, um, uh, like they have this meditation on the grid, right? Which like for the art history, like nerds in the room um, has been talked about this like ground zero of modernism. And, and if we think about these in terms of abstraction, um, which is typically talked about in terms of autonomy and formalism, um, your work in contrast, while it engages these like abstract methods, um, really has like political stakes. I wonder if you can just touch on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I am very, very interested in throwing, um, turning a lot of that stuff around on its head and um, trying to show that the grid has this generative history that runs contrary to those histories and um, changing the access point for viewership so that, you know, um, it, it just gets to be renamed in, in, in the service of a different viewer. I mean, yeah. I, I really, I, I mean, I, um, my, my connection to the grid is not that formalist painting, yeah. um, Kind of modern modernist history although I, I i know about it and i know how important it is to a lot of painters and it's not to say that um it's worthless but it really um doesn't have anything to do with these paintings yeah yeah i love that about them <laughs> um i love that they're a little deceptive that way um and so you know one um one question I guess I maybe have for um, Diana and Ellen is that you're both kind of dealing with this, um, I guess I would say kind of an indirect way of um, image making, by which I mean, you're kind of taking things from the world, you're sort of processing them some way, and then you're coming out with 
this kind of visual language at the end. Um, and, you know, so Diana, you're working with this kind of very idiosyncratic, like personal voc, I think like visual vocabulary that gets like combined and recombined and layered. And Ellen, you're processing this information through like a really specific patterning language. So uh, same question I kind of asked Austin, asked Austin earlier is, you know, how, how, what is the place of the viewer here in kind of encountering and contending with those visual systems for, how do they access um, that work? Or what do you think is the role of the viewer there? Well, I, I hope that there is a delight. I hope that the viewer finds delight in even just looking at the color or the texture. Um, I think there's an understanding that it's a personal vocabulary that they don't, they don't have to see any one thing. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. You might have to think about it a little more. <laughs> I think this is just something we come up against as viewers, um, you know, when we're encountering like how to experience a visual language, right? And I think delight is a good enough, like um, it's part of the visual pleasure, right? Of, of looking um, and experiencing artworks. Um, one of the um, kind of loose themes in Lonely Hearts is the sort of general absence of the body or like a recognizable figure um, throughout the works in the show. There's not really any like recognizable figuration. Um, I'm putting recognizable on there because I do think Ellen's works have a figurative and I would love to hear more about this. Um, but we have many works in the show that deal with these kinds of fields of mark making that have to be kind of um, decoded somehow by a viewer. But I think that the body is in fact like pretty implicit in all of your work. Um, and so I, I don't know if this is a question so much as an observation and I might pass it first to Austin um, if this question interests you, like the role of the artist's own art making body is like revealed when we talk about our process. And I think specifically Austin about your, um, you, this is small, but you, you know, you describe the work of making these prints as pulls. And I think there's that, that's a bodily like action. That's like a repetitive thing that you're doing. That's like this labor of printmaking of, of um, screen printing. And so I wonder like, um, when we talk about, you know, this process, we talk about like the role of the artist making the work. We talk about the, you know, the artist's labor here in your work that you're making, um, like, how do you, like, what, what does that mean for you? Oh, yeah, um, so a lot, because, so typically in screen printing, the labor is what's kind of erased. Uh, because of the stencil, you're getting a flat color over and over, so you're not actually seeing that physical strain of the pull of the printer happening hundreds of times over and over. Um, so in a way, revision brings that pull back to life by even animating it. But even in this series of the pulls, you're seeing the remnants of, of each one that came before it, how they kind of accumulate uh, one after the other. Yeah, you're right. The, um, if I just see a screen print, um, right. And, and, you know, the whole, um, uh, the whole like history and discourse around screen printing in the 20th century is one of like, removing artistic labor, right? Of just like production line and assembly. Um, and so I wonder, yeah, how do, you, how do you think about that? Your work seems to kind of position itself in tension to that a little bit. Oh, absolutely. Well, yeah, because I guess it's my, I don't know, the way I come at the stencil. So what you see throughout graduation into the pole series and into revision is the stencil is always stagnant. It's always one static um, rectangular shape. And that's because I'm not interested in the stencil making the image. I'm interested in my pull and also the screen participating in making the image. Um, and I think that's kind of the, the departure from something that might be more um, kind of commercial or, or that sort of, yeah. Yeah, and it, it, gives us this, it gives it this very painterly quality uh, as well. Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, uh, the first time I did the, the pull series and seeing all the ink kind of move around in these weird ways and um, be stuck in the screen, 
you know, I, I, you know, kind of step back for a second, but then realizing that that was actually something I could use to uh, develop the image was, uh, was exciting. Yeah, it's got that same element of chance and like, you know, what are you going to kind of get and end up with? Oh, yeah, the minute you pull the squeegee up, depending on the ink and the viscosity, all of a sudden a drip can just like run to the other side of the squeegee and drop and it completely changes the, the gradient, yeah. or at least mars it a bit. Um, and I wondered about something you said, Austin, also in our print, in our um, exchange before the talk, which was that the print matrix itself is just, uh, we were talking about constraint and that you said the print matrix itself, itself is defined by constraint. Um, and I think a little bit about that. I think a little bit about Diana's interest in creating um, these matrices that have that record, not just mark making, but also revision in and of itself, um, erasure. Um, and, you know, I, I wonder if you can say a little more, any of you, each of you, and, and Ellen too, as someone new to print, like how you think about that matrix as like what potential it has for you in your um, investigation and like what is productive about engaging in that for you. Oh, absolutely, yeah, if it's, I'll, I can start. Um, so I think of the matrix as just a series of constraints that are all layered on top of each, uh, each other as kind of a structure for image making. And so for screen print, I look at each constraint that I'm thinking about, whether it's the size of the screen, the use of the stencil, even the pull, which typically is just a straight pull. It's very consistent. Even curving that is kind of a, a deviation from um, a constraint. Um, and then even the use of the squeegee, you know, creating it as more of a tool or something that I can edit and play with. All of those are variables that I can edit and change. And in editing and changing those, that's what's producing the work. The work is kind of those changes and those things that I'm considering and thinking about. Diana? Sure, Austin, I love what you just said. The matrix is a constraint. I think you said that. Mm -hmm. At least that's how I paraphrased it. Um, you know, each medium sort of guides you in its own unique way. Um, it's interesting, Ellen, to hear you talk about how you work with gouache and how you worked with lithography and how, you know, the, the media, it creates both a constraint, but also it, it creates a guide. Um, etching has its own unique characteristics, some of which I talked about earlier in our conversation. You know, the, the line quality is so distinctive and the ability to, to layer color in a way that reminds you of certain things or, you know, reminds you of a, a bruise or a blush, whereas relief print is very flat and you don't always get that. So I think the media has, gives a lot provides a lot. I mean, I think for me that my main constraint is the is this is the paper, is the scale and the size and the dimension of the paper. And that tells me, you know, like how big shapes can be and if they're too big, how they get folded and how things are placed. And then once all that is um, decided, then, you know, then I know how transparencies need to happen. And um, yeah, I mean, fitting everything in the paper is how I create the, they're kind of like visual puzzles for myself. And I love it when they get just bonkers complicated. And so like as much complication as I can add, which is also why Tamarin was awesome because I mean, let's add, let's add another color let's add another plate it's just like making as much happen within that paper um happen without it becoming so frenzied and abstract that it doesn't hold together anymore yeah and and just to loop back around to a question i i had asked austin and i think is it seems very important for you as well ellen and tell me tell me if i'm if i'm interpreting that right but 
the place of your own labor here as a maker, the place of the labor of these women whose garments you're, you're working with and thinking about and trying to um, kind of recover, um, it seems very important. And I wonder if maybe we can just close in, in thinking about um, what that place is, uh, what the place for you is for your own artistic labor and the time that you invest and what that means for you. I mean, I, I, um, I, am, I am inspired and motivated by the recovering histories of, you know, unknown women artists that were maybe crafters in the generation before me or the generation that I'm in that were completely overlooked because their medium didn't conform to the sorts of mediums that we celebrated in the 70s and 80s and 90s. And, um, you know, in all my research in, in the UK trying to recover these histories, I've yet to find a single sweater. They don't exist. They, nobody kept them. They're not in any archives. So, um, yeah, I mean, shining a light on these histories is very important to me. I think that is a good place to stop if we don't have any more questions from our audience. Thank you, everybody, um, for joining us tonight. Thank you, uh, Ellen. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Austin, for chatting with me. It's been a real pleasure. I wish we had like a lot more time uh, to talk about all your work. Um, thank you to Emma, who's behind the scenes running the tech for me tonight. And thank you to Caption Access for the captioning tonight. Um, you can see Lonely Hearts, New Prints, Summer 2021 at IPCNY until September 18. You can plan a visit, explore the works, and learn more about all of our programs at ipcny.org. Um, these talks have been so fun. It's our last one for the summer. Um, but stay up to date on everything we're doing at IPCNY on Instagram or subscribe to our newsletter for the most up-to-date information on what's going on. We are going to be formally announcing our fall program in the coming weeks, so stay tuned to hear more about that. Um, thank you. I see everyone saying good night. Nick Ruth, hello. Thank you. Mike Marks, hi. We have Julie. We have any more uh, New Prince artists who want to say hello. I'm giving shout outs apparently. Uh, thank you all for coming. I see that there's a Mike Marks in the background behind Austin, uh, so Mike's represented here tonight as well. Um, thank you. Nina's here. Hi, Nina. Thank you, everybody. Um, New Prince is a lot of fun. It's been a fantastic community and it's been good to meet all of you this summer. Um, and if the people at home can just take the survey, it's going to open in your browser when we close the Zoom. Um, thanks a lot. It really helps us make better talks in the future. Um, everybody have a fantastic night. Thanks very much. <laughs>